Well, good morning. So wonderful to see you and have you here with us this morning, each one of you. And uh, we're so glad that you, the wind blew you in. And uh, <laughs> the ladies had to spend a little extra time, I know, this morning getting their hair straightened out. So that's OK. But we're so glad you're here. This morning, we are in the book of Acts, continuing in our march through the book of Acts. And in the portion that was read to us is where we are. May I remind you that in this context, we are just, well, we're less than two months from the time that Christ Jesus died on Calvary's cross, that he rose from the grave. And even more recent than that, after 40 days, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, even that which we just read about. This is that day of Pentecost, may I remind you. An unusual day, a, fe a feast day for Israel, a festive day, and there is a large gathering on the Temple Mount, and here the Holy Spirit, in a very unusual way, appeared uh, in flames and tongues of appearance that can really not be described, and then ultimately landing upon these Galileans that had followed Christ with them speaking in precise foreign languages of those various Jews that had been gathered from all parts of then Asia Minor. And this was a supernatural display of God. And you may recall that Back, in fact, I'm looking at it, Acts chapter 2, if you're turning there, in verse 12, they were astonished, and it says, and continued in amazement and perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? And of course, what Peter did is answer from Scripture Using the prophet Joel, Peter said, God is showing us it is the last times. God is getting our attention. And I know, says Peter, and he wasn't saying that arrogantly, I know what God is communicating. And so when we begin and down in verse 22, which is where we are today, he will say, men of Israel, listen to these words. Listen to these words. You know, I can't help but think. There sure is a lot of voices going on today, right? A lot of news, a lot of jabber. And what we need is to listen to the word of God. Nothing like that. And so that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. So let me ask the Lord's blessing on our time together as we look beginning in verse 22, please. Father, we're so grateful again to be in your word. We're so grateful to be called the children of the Most High God. We're thankful to be here this morning and we're thankful for those that have come. Father, with all the things going on in our world, in our nation, turn our attention and our focus back to Thee. Oh, how wonderful that You have all these things in Your hands. And how wonderful, most importantly, that Jesus Christ has come and died on behalf of sinners. Father, help us to understand that today. Help me to communicate it. Glorify your name in our midst. Gracious Lord, help me to get this right and use this time to put our minds and our hearts in the right places where there needs those that really haven't embraced you yet. I pray that you would trouble them, Father, that they might embrace you. For those of us that maybe are weary or tired or whatever it be, may we be built up in the most holy faith. How we thank you that your word does all these things. There's nothing like it. And so we praise you this morning that we can come with this word in front of us, praising your name and giving thanks. 
Help us to do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there was a statement made years ago by the tent evangelist by the name of Oral Roberts. And, uh, you know, Oral Roberts University up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as a result of that man's ministry. But he made a, a little phrase that became something of a hallmark in all of modern evangelism. That is, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. But the problem with that is, it's true but not true. <laughs> okay, I'm going to deal with that to one degree or another. Because it doesn't really accurately conform to Scripture it doesn't conform to the problem of man or the revealed means in Scripture of which we are to approach those that are outside of Jesus Christ. And here in our context, Peter is dealing with these very religious but lost people at the temple. You know, what they think is that God is very impressed with them. And if we came up to them and said, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, like, well, <laughs> you know, you're right, brother. The starting point in man's relation to God is man's incredible problem in sin. There is a problem in sin that began in the Garden of Eden. And we are sinners because we have sin nature. This morning, we studied early the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the book of Lamentations. And all that that pertains to is relative to the problem of man's sin and their rejection of God even God's covenant people. Because man in sin is in an inescapable problem. And it's never God who needs to align with man, but man needs to align with God. And God's only means, the essential, is the life that is given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our world and our culture, and even, I'm afraid, in most or many churches, are saturated with humanism. And humanism seeks to put man at the forefront and promote self-importance. It seeks to put man on the throne instead of God on the throne where he must be because only God is God. Now, these Peter addresses on the Temple Mount are very religious people, very serious, sober, sincere people, yet lost. And what we have before us in our teaching today is a rebuke of their thinking and actions that are given in the strongest terms. They are not in line with the true God, even though they think they are. They are not objects of His love. They are actually enemies of God. And all we have to do is study something like Romans chapter 5 to understand that. Salvation is getting man, getting self, out of the way. And putting God on the throne of our life where He, lo uh, where he belongs, that He may reign over each one of us from within us. Now, in order to dethrone self and to enthrone God, it's not God loves you, but to understand the breach between God and man and the solution that He alone brings in Jesus Christ. So dethroning requires the truth. A reality of 
self-assessment, a need for God that must be faced. And so what we have before us is the first inspired gospel message after the cross. Did you ever think about that? This is it. A message very revealing in its content, approach, and accomplished results. And so Peter doesn't start with butter and flattery. <laughs> Amazingly so. That here's this fellow that just a short time before had denied his Lord in the most profane manner and now he's standing before this same group of people, in fact a much larger group of people, and he is heralding what they need to hear uncompromisingly. Would you begin with me by looking at 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians, the words of the Apostle Paul, but they're so important to understand today in our relation with God and in our help in trying to help others to know God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verses 1 to 5. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, what's going to happen to God's people? Suffer, be mistreated, troubled. The world loves darkness, not light. And so he says, for our exhortation does not, verse 3, does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. We must tell the truth. The gospel is not political correctness. And as Galatians 1.10 says, if we want to please men, we cannot please God. And so, as Peter and Paul, we must give the message of this word. Not dressing it up, not dressing it down, but providing what God has revealed. And by the way, that's what love is. As 1 Corinthians 13 says, love rejoices in the truth. Sometimes the truth is very difficult. In fact, most of the time the truth is very difficult to swallow, isn't it? We see that in the political realm. We saw all sorts of anger and opposition and trouble, but we see that most significantly in the spiritual realm. And so when I'm saying this, it doesn't mean that we should see how harsh <laughs> that we can be with God's Word, but it means that we don't compromise God's revelation. In love we bring the truth necessary for salvation. Because it is the truth that sets men free. God transforms lives by truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 or James 1.18 In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by political correctness. No. He brought us forth by the word of truth. There's nothing as precious as truth, our Lord Jesus would in His high priestly prayer play, pray, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And so when we begin here to look at what Peter is doing with these religiously lost individuals that are under the wrath of God and will die and go to hell unless they receive the truth from God. They so desperately need. He comes in boldness to them. And after establishing in verses 14 to 21 that God, through the prophet Joel, displayed the supernatural events they just witnessed, he now, in the boldest 
and necessary terms brings them to the conviction of the gospel where they're going to cry out, what must we do? That's where every man needs to come, every woman and boy and girl, to come to the end of themselves, to have some recognition of the error of the natural way of man. That Jesus Christ can then be received and be the transformer that he is. Okay, so he says, after having their ear now, the opportunity is ripe and present. And in verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, now listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Jesus the Nazarene is the name the Lord was known by in all of Israel. Very prominent figure in that day. Obviously everybody had heard of Jesus. And many, if not most of the people, had seen him and seen his miracles. And that's why he would say, a man attested to you. Attested is to exhibit to the point of proof. And where was this proof from? He says, by God. Attested to you by God. With Miracles with wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. You know, when one of their members, a very prominent member, uh, Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus by night, the very first thing he said to him is, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He knew that. And he listed them. Or Peter listed them here for you. Miracles and wonders and signs. All supernatural things. God performed them through the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a, an iron-clad, shut-the-door fact. There's no argument here. Uh, you, you don't say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. There is no argument, there's no refute, there's no debate. They knew that what Peter was stating was true, and today we must deal with the truth. We know what this book is, is the truth. It's been sought after to be maligned, to be defiled, to be eliminated, to be rejected, to be shown to be in error for 2,000 years, and nobody can do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. Now, Peter says, this was in your midst. Not something supposedly that happened somewhere, but God made sure that they were personal witnesses and that the reality of the things that Christ did in the masses that were present could not be denied or could not be rejected and he says just as you yourselves know in other words this is hitting those otherwise truth suppressors of Romans 1 of which we are all out of that mold naturally right between the eyes and that's what truth does the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Nothing is like the Word of God, in other words. Nothing can penetrate like that. No slick words, no smooth, smooth talk, no flattery, nothing else can do it, but only the Word of God. And so truth eliminates real debate. The truth is evident, and we don't have to be shy, even though we are. <laughs> and I'm shy too, by the way. Some of you might find it hard to believe, but I am. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. So the reality of Christ, of Christianity, the Bible, is not something hard to believe. 
You know, the truth of the matter is, it's hard not to believe. It's hard not to believe. And if anybody in the sound of my voice is still rejecting it, and, ah, that's just your idea, you're some kind of a crazy nut up there, uh, you need to be honest with yourself. Romans 1 says that very thing. That the, even though they knew God, they honored him not as God, and neither were they thankful. And that would be the camp that you fall into if you're not embracing his truth and saying, oh God, use your truth to change me. I need changing. I need thee. Well, after establishing this opening statement that he makes in verse 22. He begins in verse 23. Peter is not smooth talking, but he says, this man, literally man is not there, but this, it's implied, this man Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The focus was on this man or this Savior, this one called Jesus the Nazarene, and that focus is there today. He is the focus of everything about the Word of God. He is the focus of the Christian's life. He is the King and Lord over all. He is the sovereign who will rule forever and all of eternity. And so where preaching and teaching is not focused on Christ, it's focused on you and what a fine piece of work you are and I am and all that kind of stuff. That's not the gospel. <laughs> That's humanism. He says he was delivered over, ek dotus which really is a word which means surrendered. It is the idea of willful giving over. Now these individuals that crucified him thought that he was just a helpless victim. They got the best of him. He was no victim. He surrendered. He purposely and willfully surrendered. And here we are told, by the predetermined plan. Predetermined is the word harazo, which literally means to mark out a boundary. We think of the term that we use for horizon, the boundary of the horizon where we can see the sun and the earth meeting together. Who is it that marked out that boundary? The idea is God determined all the exacting details beforehand, before the foundation of the earth, God predetermined His plan and He is carrying it out and it was designed from the beginning. Is anybody going to stop that plan? Is there anything going to get in the way of that plan? No. Hallelujah. And that has so much power behind it. You just think of one thing. What can separate you from the love of God if you are one of His? Nothing. Any more than anybody could stop the plan of God, Satan and all of his power and abilities couldn't stop the hand of God. And in crushing Satan, he just performed God's will. All these exacting details beforehand. It was God's plan and design from the beginning. Now he uses the term also foreknowledge, which has at its base prognosco, but here the word is prognosis, really. To know fully before is prognosco, to know, and it always has with it an element not only of absolute knowledge of everything, but absolute relationship with that knowledge. So that when you're speaking of those that know Jesus Christ, they not only know about Him or have an, an adequate information about Him, 
They know him by relationship. And here you see, it is in the dative case, meaning it is more than just seeing the future, but with certainty of determining the future. In other words, it's more like ordaining the future, not just a mere look down the corridors of time into the future. Now, who can understand these things? <laughs> Nobody. And when we cross these terms, we're always above our reasoning abilities. We are dealing with the sovereign will of an omnipotent, omniscient God. What do we know? Christ on the cross was not some fancy afterthought or, well, if you do this, I'll do that, or fancy maneuver somehow or another. But by design, perfectly planned from the very beginning and all eternity past by our all-wise God, we call that sovereignty. God is God. Isn't that simple? But who can understand that? This revelation of God's plan was important in this message, wasn't it? That's why Peter said it. And, and may I say that it's important then today as well that people begin to understand that this one with whom they have to do is not some old uh, lovey-dovey old man up in the sky somewhere. And I'm, please forgive me for if I'm sounding irreverent here that is sort of forgetful, but he just loves everybody, and, and uh, he's trying to do the best he can to get people saved, and he can't quite get it done, you know, and so forth and so on. That's not God. That's not God at all. God is not struggling in his dealing with man. Everything is exacting. And the issue again is not God aligning with us, but are we aligned with God? And that's what the Word of God does when we come into it and we begin to explore it and, and read it and take it into our being is that we begin to understand more and more and more of Him. That's why our theme verse over here, that I may know Him. That's what we need to know. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to know Him Like I hope we'll know him someday in his presence. But even then, we're, we're always going to be exploring God. I think throughout eternity, we're never going to really grasp. We're always going to be standing in awe. We're always going to be heralding his glory because he's God. Now, he also says here, you nailed to a cross. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Woo! That's, that sure wasn't a very nice statement. Couldn't you find a nice, smoother way to say that for Pete's sake? You know, like, you know, we know you had a bad day that day and you just, maybe it's something you ate. You here is a reference to the Jews, his own people, the covenant people, may I say. The leaders of Israel were the legislators of Christ's death. And he says through godless men, the Romans who were pressured to carry out the hideous execution that I believe had to do with the very words of Christ on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I think it was probably more directly a reference to the Roman soldiers who were just trying under pressure to do what the Jews wanted to try to keep the peace. You nailed to a cross and put him to death. Your own Messiah. And here's the amazing thing, isn't it? Behind it all was God, didn't, wasn't it? <laughs> this is exactly what God wanted to do. But they did it. And they are culpable. 
They are completely guilty. Look back at Luke 22 where we see this same pressure point between God's sovereignty and the will of man if there is such a thing. I just think it's mainly because we don't understand from our finite standpoint. Look at verse 20, Luke 22, verse 22. Christ says, For indeed the Son of Man, that's Himself, is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man, Judas, by whom He is betrayed. It's been determined what Christ would do, die on the cross. And it was also determined that Judas would betray him. But woe to Judas. That doesn't mean, okay, I have an excuse. You determined it. Therefore, I can do whatever I want. And that really is the issue. Judas was doing what he wanted to do. These Jews were doing what they wanted to do. It was their will. They loved darkness. They hated the Messiah. He was a threatening force against their power and their authority. And he spoke against them and their hypocrisy. And so they wanted to put him to death. But God is so glorious that he uses every bit of that he weaves it and folds it and shapes it together so that even the evil produces good. Isn't that amazing? Praise God today that that is still going on. Now, today we cannot blame God for our sin or our behavior, while at the same time we fully recognize that God's in absolute control of our personal history. He's in control of your personal history in the same way He was in control of sending Christ to the cross. And every one of the terrible evil deeds that you and I have committed, I'm going to really step out here a minute and somebody's going to throw something, were predetermined by God. Now He didn't do it, you did it, I did it. Boy, try to understand that and get your hands around it. If that's not so, then God is not God. He didn't just wind us up and let us go. Even the hairs of our head are counted. So God is in absolute control. But we, we, are without excuse. We are without excuse. Now beginning down in verse 24, and I'm moving too slow here, we have this wonderful little but God. <laughs> have you ever noticed these but gods in Scripture? Here's man going along here, making a mess out of everything that he touches. And he does left to himself, or so to speak, he turns everything into crud and corruption. But God! <laughs> and there is the, this wonderful hinge there that takes place. But God. What did God do? They put Christ to death, but God raised Him up again, putting the, an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. So here's this change, this intervention by God, purposely again brought about by God's wisdom and power. Now, as only God could have ordained His Son to become a man in the first place, the incarnation, and to put Him to death by sinners, as we've already read, predetermined counsel and foreknowledge, so only God's power could raise Him up again. And his great purpose, he says here, putting an end to the agony of death. The resurrection of Christ destroyed death that began back in the garden, remember? 
Dying you shall surely die, and we have been dying. And we will die. But I've got good news for you. Jesus Christ has defeated death. There's nothing more wonderful than that. There's no enemy like death. Some of you have just recently experienced loved ones losing them. And even though they're in glory, it hurts. There's nothing as awful as death. But Jesus Christ has defeated death. You know the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You know, in that passage, Paul is mocking death. We can mock death in Jesus Christ. Well, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, he says in Romans 8. Not even death can separate us from the love of Christ if we're in Christ Jesus. And this was his plan all along. Because only God could restore what was lost in the garden. And only God could defeat death. Because death couldn't hold the Son of God. How ridiculous to think so. Him who is life. Him who is the power of life. And may I say that back in verse 21 of Acts 2, Notice that passage which I think is at the heart of this. It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's nothing more refreshing than that. That's the central theme here of all of this. Christ has defeated death. And He did it miraculously. He did it wonderfully. And then in, to add credence, we have this sure ending in my outline Verses 25 to 28, to add credence to his words as he's speaking to men who claim the Old Testament, he uses again the Old Testament prophecy out of Psalm 16. And Psalm 16 is a messianic psalm. What I mean by that is it was a psalm written by David, but obviously in the context it is referring to not specifically to David, but to the Lord Jesus that, would, that he's a type of as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And even in the argument that's given here, that is given here, it clearly shows that's what God had intended through David. Notice he says, For God says of him, the him being Messiah, our Lord Jesus, and he says, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. This right hand here, of course, that's where Christ is today. But it has with it the idea of affection, of power, of a place of of exaltation with God. Therefore, he could never be shaken because he's under the wing, as it were, of God the Father. He's in the care of God the Father. Now keep that in mind as we go further, and I'll have some application for that. And he says in verse 26, Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. He had a sense of joy. Even when he was on the earth, knowing he was going to the cross. Isn't that what Hebrews 12.2 says? For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. For the joy set before him, his joy was found in doing his Father's will. His joy was found in knowing the end result that I am going to defeat death. I am going to be a granter of life to all who will put their faith and confidence in me. And so he goes on to say in verse 27, Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay, 
And this context has reference to the grave and separation from God. And God superintended all of that just like He predetermined everything about it and that plan, etc. And so the weight of this, despite the trial of death, is on the confidence prophetically of the Messiah that God would not allow His ultimate destruction. Your Holy One is directly a reference to Christ and could only be accomplished by His resurrection. So therefore, when he says that he wouldn't allow his Holy One to undergo decay, it speaks of the resurrection which Peter will address shortly here. And notice in verse 28, this is all Psalm 16, You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Made known to me the ways of life full of gladness with your presence. Christ knew the glory of real life with God. And such knowledge made him full of gladness in his temporary persecution and ordeal of, of death with the anticipation of reuniting of, with the Father in glory. And it should be the same with us. We do that by faith, but we look on these words here we do this by faith of what God has promised. God who cannot tell a lie. And that becomes all hope for us. Now David will make his bottom line argument in 29 to 36. And we're not going to get there today, as you can see. But David was not speaking of himself again, but Christ. Thus the scriptures foretold all that Jesus would do. Now, in closing, Peter is explaining this to these religious Christ rejectors. Christ is their Messiah. And they were performing God's will and rejecting Him, and yet they are so guilty that it's beyond comprehension how guilty they are. Nobody has committed a greater crime than putting Christ on that cross the very Son of God. But it was still God who contrived the cross. And it shows you the depth of our sin. It shows the necessity of God's wrath against sin. But it was all part of the plan. Every person alive all of us are guilty for our sin. And if you're one that is still rejecting God, rejecting Christ, those sins and that culpability is all hanging around your neck and hanging on your head. And you have nothing of a future to look forward to. I can say that boldly, emphatically, and truthfully from the Word of God. But now, there is a promise of a wonderful plan for those. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I said it was true and not true. That's not true of the ungodly. And I mean by ungodly, those who have rejected His Son. For what is stated here, though, about a wonderful plan... In verses 24 to 28 of Christ applies to all of us by faith. Do you realize that? Every one of us could sing this song of himself. Why? Because Christ became our substitute and we are sons of God through him. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 1 real quickly in closing. Ephesians chapter 1. I don't know if you've ever thought about how precious this little phrase, in Him, is. In Him. Look at Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings, blessing in the heavenly places in 
Christ. That little phrase, in Christ, it's like you're within Him. He is covering you. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. He took it all for us, is the whole point. And so everything can be said here. You look, look at down at verse 7 of, of Ephesians 1. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Look down at verse 13. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are sealed in Him. He will never let you go. You are His forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In fact, Peter, just so we can see what he says later, look at 1 Peter real quickly. And I said that would be my last, but hey, let's look at one more. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter, I think it's at the end, chapter 5. Look at verse, 1 Peter 5.10. Now these people were persecuted. This was a troubled group that Peter was writing to. And he says, after you have suffered for a little while, and by the way, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom, God's people are going to suffer. They're going to have problems. We're not exempt from all of that. God tests us. Our faith is tested. It's part of our testimony before others. All of that. Is part of living the Christian life. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, there it is, will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So what is the issue? The issue is being in Christ. So that all that can be said of Christ, it's just as though He is, he is carrying us through the, all of the things that He put up with, all the things that He tolerated, all of the mis, uh, abuse and the troubles and trials and difficulties, the beatings and the scourgings and the crucifixion. He was carrying it all for us in His own body on the tree, which we celebrate here in a few minutes because He gave His life a ransom for many. And so when we go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 28, there's the summation really in so many ways. If you're in Christ, you have made known to me the ways of life. Has He made known to you the ways of life? That's what we're talking about here. This is the way of life in Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. In Psalm 16, I think it literally says, in thy presence is the fullness of joy. Nobody's going to ever experience joy, happiness, like that which yet awaits God's people in His presence. Like these pious religious people who thought God loved them for their religious deeds but were yet blind. Have you seen your guilt and recognized that Christ, the only Savior, by faith can be called upon, just as it says back up in verse 21, and with that calling upon Him that peace can be made with God, Romans 5 again says, Therefore we, those in Christ Jesus, have peace with God through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Oh, I pray that anybody that might be listening or thinking and your, your mind is dealing with these things, oh, come to Christ. 
oh, I know you can't come unless he's calling you. But your part is to come to him, all right? And if you are in Christ Jesus, but you've become weary, you're weary of the, of the journey and the trouble of the journey, does this not also speak to you too? Keep your eyes on Christ. You are in Christ. He has sealed you. And He is moving you towards that time when you will be in His presence forevermore and be in the fullness of His joy. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Father, we thank You for the words of truth we thank you that you save individuals. You're still the Savior of, of sinners. You're still moving today to save. And how I pray thee that you would save, that you would encourage, that you would replenish, that you would refresh. And help us, Father, those that know you, to keep on keeping on, to walk and fight the good fight of faith. we thankful. We are so thankful that you are God who is on the throne. And you have all these things in your wonderful hand, your sovereign, uh, omnipotent hand of mercy. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.